I'm Ashley Jones, and I'm excited to be here with you this week for Software Success. You guys know this live presentation is all about Dimes Software. Each month, we do a different software, and we go into in-depth details of how to use your program. So if you know me, I love my software. I could not live without it. My embroidery would not be the same without it. And I want all of you guys to love your software just as much as I do. So that's what we do on Software Success twice a month on the first and the third Tuesday of each month. So while we're letting everyone roll in, uh, let's see where everybody's watching from. So I always love to see who's uh, joining. And so I have to give Mary Larson a shout out. She was the first one here, the first one to comment. So thank you for joining Mary Larson. She's a frequent flyer over on our software user group, and she's very knowledgeable and always helpful with questions. So uh, Maria Soto from Tucson, Arizona, thank you for joining. We've got Melanie from Florida. We've got Janice from Kansas. Uh, Lois. Hey, Lois from Austin, Texas. Um, Laura from West Virginia. Swanee, Georgia. Hey, Jane, thanks for joining. Um, so, so good to see all you guys. If you haven't already, pipe in, tell us where you're watching from. Hey, Chris. Chris is a frequent flyer also. Um, thanks for watching our presentations. My friend Charlotte Turner, thanks for joining, Charlotte. Um, Delaware, we have Deb um, from Jel Delaware, Chris C from Cincinnati. So I love seeing everyone join. We've got Oregon, North Carolina, um, Amarillo, Texas, Washington State. So love it. Beautiful part of the country up there. So Welcome, welcome, everybody. So we're talking about my block piecer today. Um, so we're talking about piecing in the hoop. So do all of you guys uh, have um, my block piecer? Have you pieced in the hoop? Uh, tell me that over in the chat as well. So um, hi, Deb from Texas. Thanks for joining my friend, Bet. Uh, thanks for joining, Bet. She's from Arizona. And uh, Missouri, thanks, Brenda, for joining from Missouri. New Orleans, I'm from originally north of Mobile, so that is so close to home. Thanks for joining, Linda. Um, so many people here. I love seeing all of you guys. So my block piecer um, is what we're talking about today, and we are um, going to go into more depth, probably more so than you've uh, seen in, in our presentations. Um, lots of good information. If you like piecing in the hoop, um, you're going to love this. Uh, it's a really fun in the hoop project, um, and this software will... Um, instantly turn a block into the stitch file needed to uh, create that block in the hoop. So um, today, piecing in the hoop with my block piecer, um, we're going to talk about how to get started. So if you're brand new to my block piecer, whether you own it or you don't, then uh, you can follow along with this. If you want to just kind of give it a, a trial run, you can do that as well. We're going to talk about um, the basics. So getting started, selecting the block, resizing it, and then um, turning it into an embroidery file and getting that to your embroidery machine. So um, it's really, really fun and super easy, a lot easier than you think. So Carolyn says, I have my block piecer and love it. So thanks for uh, joining, Carolyn. I think you'll love the tips that I have uh, today. So, um, and then Jennifer Alexander, thanks for joining. She's another frequent flyer, answers a lot of questions over there on our Facebook group as well. Um, and Dawn uh, from Creative Applique is another software need. Yes, Dawn, you do. It's like one of the easiest things uh, you can do and it'll turn your block into a piece in the hoop block for sure. Um, and then Kathy says, I need info on how to use my AccuQuilt dies with my block piecer. So Kathy, um, I will give you uh, some tips when I'm in the software about that. It's really all about the size, setting the correct size for your die. And that's really all you need to know. And then you can cut it out with your AccuQuilt die. So, and then Diane says, hi from Florida. Thanks for joining Diane. So, uh, so welcome everyone. I'm excited to talk about this. So if you have not done uh, piecing in the hoop before, um, I normally go right into the software, but piecing in the hoop is, is quite different than our regular embroidery. So I do have some images to kind of go through the process. So what we are talking about today with our My Block Piecer program is taking a block, 
any block that you have built into the software and you can create your own as well. And I'll show you that probably two weeks from now, because that's a little bit more of um, the advanced part of this program, but you just know that you can create your own custom blocks. And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but the software will generate the stitch file, which is what's on the right there for you to piece that block in the hoop. And notice it's numbered. It gives you the number order. So you know exactly where uh, to place the next piece of fabric. Now you can pre-cut these pieces or you can do it like applique where you place down a large piece and then uh, just trim as it tacks it down, just like you would um, an applique tack down as well. So, um, and Jan says, have my, my block piecer and haven't used it much yet. Well, Jan, I hope this uh, gets you interested and um, gets you started with it. So, um, Sheila, hi, Sheila. Um, piecing in the hoop sounds interesting. It is very interesting. If you like doing things with your embroidery machine, it is definitely something uh, that you're going to really enjoy. So, so, um, and then Susan says, so is it paper piece? It's, it is similar to paper piece because you do have stabilizer and you are stitching the seams together and it is being tacked down on that stabilizer. So it is similar to paper piecing, but your embroidery machine is doing all of the work, Susan. So you're going to love this. So, so let me walk through, uh, these steps over here, um, on my slides and I'll show you what to expect. So that stitch file that you see there on the right, that's the first thing that's going to stitch. So you hoop a piece of stabilizer um, and stitch that layout. So that layout, that placement guide is the shape of your block. And you will get a customized placement guide for every single block that you create in my block piecer. And then you're going to follow the number order in putting your fabric down. But the first piece of fabric is always right side up. And then every piece of fabric after that, you will put faced down and then the embroidery machine will seam that together and then you'll flip it out and it'll tack it down. And then right sides together, flip it out, it'll tack it down, right side together, flip it out, tack it down, right side together, flip it out, tack it down. So then when you're done with that one block, you can see we're completely done with all of our shapes there. You will take that out of the hoop and then cut away the excess stabilizer. Now, this is uh, one block that certainly could be then duplicated. You could stitch four of these to make a larger block. You know, that's a lot of what quilting um, is all about. We make one block and then we rotate them in so many different directions to make a larger uh, block out of that one block. Um, and so you can see here in all of these different orientations, you get a completely different block. And I also want to point out when you are piecing in the hoop, it is not, you don't have to be as perfect as you do when you're piecing uh, with your sewing machine because it's a digital file you are going to be able to stitch this together and still get perfect blocks. So you can see here in this particular example, uh, the fabric is not all the way to that edge which is perfectly fine because that outside line that you see there is actually the seam allowance. That's the unfinished edge of our block. So if this is a six inch, six inch finished block, that outside stitch line is the six and a half inch mark. So that gives you that quarter inch seam allowance all the way around. And then that inside line there, that's your seam, that's your quarter inch seam. So if you did not get your fabric placed perfectly, or maybe if you trimmed it after the fact and you cut a little close, like you see here where you've got um, some areas that are not covered in fabric, that's perfectly fine because it still falls within your seam. You're going to cut away your excess stabilizer and you're still going to have that square six and a half inch block. And then you've even got that stitch line, that interior stitch line that'll give you the uh, stitch location and you can actually follow that. And I usually stitch right inside of that uh, to make sure that I don't see it whenever I open my blocks up. So 
hopefully that makes uh, sense. But piecing by embroidery machine, you've got a perfectly pieced block because you can see even though our, our edges are not perfect, the block itself is perfect every time because it's a digital file that's creating that block. And we know when things are digital, a lot of times they are more perfect than we can do because there's always human error involved when we get our hands <laughs> started in there. So I see some questions questions have already popped up. So I'll answer those quickly before we go over to the software. Um, and uh, the first one from Linda, she says, could you use the wash away stabilizer? So honestly, um, Linda, what we do is we use uh, a stabilizer that is a tear away wash away. So it doesn't completely dissolve, but it just gets softer the more you wash. You could do it on a completely wash away stabilizer, but then um, if you wait, to wash your quilt until it's all quilted and everything. You know how your completely wash away stabilizer, um, it kind of um, has a stickiness to it if it doesn't completely dissolve. So that's why we use the tear away wash away because you don't get that. Um, and also you can use a cutaway that's a lightweight cutaway, like a no show cutaway. That's a very lightweight stabilizer that would then maintain uh, the shape of your block. It would stay in your block forever, very much like foundation piecing where we leave that foundation in our block. Whereas in paper piecing, we usually rip the paper away. So those are our two stabilizers that we like to, to use. And then Linda, thank you, Linda, for putting the question marks. That makes it easy to pick out of the lineup. So um, does the, the use of stabilizer cause the finished block to be too stiff? And no, it does not. So um, if you use the wash away, tear away stabilizer, um, it gets softer and softer as you wash it. It's very lightweight. Um, we have one called Peace and Stitch that we really like. And if it does bother you, which some people it does, they don't like the idea of leaving anything in their block. Um, you could actually, since it's tear away, you could rip away the large pieces, which is perfectly fine. Um, the stabilizer that's our no show stabilizer, that's a very lightweight cutaway. And that is like if you were doing foundation piecing and you were leaving that foundation in your block. So it's a lightweight cutaway stabilizer, stays forever and doesn't, um, uh, ever come out and it's going to not add a lot of weight because it's a lightweight stabilizer. So just to kind of give you that idea. So let's go over to my block piecer and see how to create these blocks with the software. And for those of you that have the software, um, I'll give you some tips for using it. If you do not have my block piecer, I'm not sure if I've um, told all of you guys this yet or not, but over here um, in the shopping cart, so in the bottom right, I'm in my embroidery tool shed. Um, in the bottom right, you have all of these little dot, dot, dots next to the software. If you do not have a check mark beside it and you click this option, you will actually have another option in the list here that says try. And you can try that software 100% free and follow along with what I'm doing today. You can watch the replay and um, step through this and see how you like the software. Now, I don't have the try option because mine has the check mark, which means that I own it. And so I uh, don't have the option to try it because I already own it. But if you don't have that check mark, you can try the software and it will allow you to do everything that I'm going to do today. Um, you just cannot save your block. And once you close out your software, open it back up, it will take that trial away. But you can actually do that trial as many times as you like. You just cannot save the file uh, to be able able to stitch it out. So, okay, to get started with my block piecer, it's the easiest thing you will ever do. There's only three steps to generate a block. The first one is to choose your block. So from this example, um, I'm going to go into our block library and I'm going to choose from one of the built-in blocks. Now, there are over 1,200 built-in blocks in uh, this program that you can choose from. If you come across a category that's blank, like this alphabet here or the curved blocks, these are blank because we cannot piece curves in the hoop. And this library is shared with another one of our software called My Quilt Embellisher. So if there are no blocks in the category, that means that it's a category that can't be pieced in the hoop. So your limitation is you cannot piece Y seams because you can't flip them out and you cannot uh, piece 
curves in the hoop either. So, and I'll show you more um, details about that whenever I bring up one of the examples on the screen. Now you could scroll through here, looking at all of uh, the blocks and figure out which one you want. So that we know what's going on, I'm going to start with a very basic one. In fact, I'm going to go to this three triangle block here is a really uh, good one to start with. So I'm going to um, select my block. That's step number one. Step number two is to set the size. There's two different ways to set the size. You can actually go ahead and choose the size here. So I can uh, choose by four by four, six by six, eight by eight, 10 by 10, or I can set a custom size, which is asking me how many inches I want. So I could do a six and a half if I wanted. So you can enter that custom size. And then when you click OK, it puts that on the screen. And if I go over here to my transform box, you can see that the width and the height is 6.5, which is what I set it at. Um, and that is a six and a half inch finished block. So once we create the file, the file itself will be seven inches because we'll have a half inch all the way around to accommodate our quarter inch seam. So, but this number could be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be six and a half. It could be four. It could be five. It could be 4.32876. I mean, it could be uh, really any size that you need. So once you set the size, that's step number two. Step number three is to select this workflow option. The workflow option will generate the stitch file. So once you do the auto build, it generates that file. I always like to click the sort numbers. Um, it puts it in number order, which obviously is helpful for where to place your fabric. And then when you click the preview, it shows the file that it's going to generate. And so here's my stitch file. All I need to do is click save and we're going to actually save this one. I'm going to do this on my uh, desktop here. And then I'm going to call this our three triangle block. You want to make sure to save this in the format for your embroidery machine. So if you use a Brother or Baby Lock, your PES is here. If you use a, um, a Janome, we have JEF. If you use a Viking or FOF, there's VP3, VIP, HUS, uh, EXP for Bernina, DST for um, your commercial formats. There's FOF formats, Singer formats. So any format that you need, you select it and then give it a name choose a location and then click save. It automatically opens up the location that it saved your file and you get three things. You get the stitch file, the PES file, which is what my embroidery machine will recognize. You get the C2S file, which remember is the native file that we can get back to and easily make edits. And then you get this PDF. So let's look at the PDF and then we'll open up that PES file. So here's my PDF file. Now the PDF file is going to uh, give you some really useful information. You can see this is our block and this is what our stitch file looks like. And it gives you personalized instructions. Let me scroll in here. And you can see step number one says it's going to stitch the placement stitch. And these are actually color coded. Every time you see blue in your color sequence, it's the placement stitch. Green is the stitch number one where we put the fabric right side up or actually piece number one. Sorry, it's stitch number two right sides up and it tacks that piece down. And then every time you see red, it's a folding stitch. Every time you see black in your color sequence, that is the tack down for that piece. So it gives you customized instructions for every single block that you do. So I'm going to close this out. And then for our files here, I'm going to do my view and extra large icons. Now, I can see these images because I own Perfect Stitch Viewer. Perfect Stitch Viewer allows you to see little images of your embroidery files in your Windows Explorer like I'm looking at here. So let's open up this file and take a closer look. So I'm going to double click it. You see it opens up in the background. So now I can say close to this particular uh, window. Now here is my stitch file. Let's watch it in slow redraw. Now, slow redraw is a feature that every dime program has and allows you to watch your design stitch out on the screen. So all of this blue 
is the placement guide of the block. So you can see that I get my numbers and I have these areas of where I'm going to place my pieces of fabric. The first color that stitches after the placement is the tack down for number one. Number one block piece is always placed down right sides up and the machine will tack it down. After that, you'll put piece number two right sides down on top of number one so that this can seam those two pieces together. Once it does that, the machine will stop because it's a different color. You'll finger press that out or you can use a, a, um, a little press. Um, you can take the hoop off and use a little mini iron if you want. You can use a little uh, seam roller. Um, I usually just finger press it and kind of scrape it with my nail and it works great. And then after you press it open, the software is going to tack that down so it doesn't accidentally flip back up. And then the next thing that's going to happen is piece number three, you will place right sides together. It will seam it together and then you will finger press that open and it will tack that down. When that's all done, you will have this block finished in the hoop. You'll take it out of the hoop and trim away the excess. So does that make sense to everyone? If you have questions, make sure you're putting that over in the, the chat. If you will put uh, like three question marks before the question, it just helps me pick out your question out of the, the align, um, out of the lineup there. So for the, for the design, so, or for the questions. <laughs> okay. So that is the very easiest way um, to do this. Select the block, step number one, set the size as step number two. And then step number three is just uh, open that workflow and build that block. When you save it, you're done. One, two, three, and you are done. Super easy. Okay. So now let's take it a little bit uh, into more detail. So I'm going to start a new workspace here. And I'm going to go back into my library and uh, let's talk about what you can't do. So these, all of these blocks that are in the um, library, the software will build and it will give you a stitch file for every single one of these. Some of them are more complicated than others. But don't let that make you think that it's going to be um, take too many hoopings. Some of them do take multiple hoopings, but there's a good number that can be done in one hooping. So, for instance, let's go down here to um, maybe like one of these boat blocks. So you can see we've got more pieces in these blocks. So if I select the block, step number one, step number two, you're going to set the size. So this can be whatever you need it to be. Six inch finish. Maybe you want to do six inches so you can have four of those together for a 12 inch block. Um, and then you're going to click that workflow and then auto build, sort numbers and preview. There's my stitch file. So you can see it doesn't have to be a really simple block. In fact, let me do one with even more pieces just to kind of make my point here. Um, and then I'll show you um, exactly what I wanted to um, mention. So let's see what we've got here. Um, this uh, paper fan is a good one. Uh, log cabins, you can piece nearly every log cabin block um, in one hooping. So let's, I'm going to choose this pineapple block here and I'll leave it eight inches. So that's my size. I chose my block. I set my size. I choose my workflow. This has 37 different pieces of fabric. You can see the center of that is actually a, a square and a square or a diamond and a square. And if I do my auto build, sort numbers. Yes, I want to sort them and do my preview. Look at that. So that's a lot of seams and a lot of pieces. So it's not about the complexity or the number of, of pieces in the, the block. It's about um, Y seams and curves. So that's the biggest thing. So let's go to a simplistic one so I can show you what I mean. So I'm going to go back to those basic blocks. The basic blocks are, are a really good set of blocks because a lot of them are your basic blocks for building a, um, a quilt block. So a lot of these are blocks that we put four of them together for a four patch uh, to create our block. So I'm going to choose this four patch here. Now this block is so simple. You would think that we could do that in one hooping, but 
if I were to piece this in the hoop, so let me um, uh, just separate these pieces out. So if I piece this piece, it'll tack down this purple piece, and then I can put this pink piece right sides together, and it will seam that for me. And so then I have uh, this half seam together. And then if I put this piece here and have it seam that piece, you can see that I cannot put this piece because it would need to seam two raw edges. And then I could not flip that out because it is a Y seam. So that's what you're having to look for um, in your block. If it is, um, the, the software does it for you. You actually don't have to look for anything. It does it for you. But there are some times where I want to reorder things. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So when you are looking for a block or building your own custom block, this is something that you have to look for. So now if I select this block, even though it has the Y seam, the software will still generate the stitch file. If I do auto build and sort numbers and click click preview, it's going to take two hoopings to do this block. So do you see how it says design number one and design number two? So design number one is actually stitching the right half and the left half in one hooping, but you can tell that there's no red seam line in between those two blocks. Because there's no red seam line, I can tell that these two pieces will not be seamed together, and I will then need to seam them together either on my sewing machine or the software does give you a second file where you can seam those together. So you would stitch this hooping, you would take this out of the hoop and cut those two apart. And then it actually tells you where to place the first side block number one and two or piece number one and two. You'll put that right sides up and it will tack it down as one unit, even though it's two pieces. And then it will seam together and you'll flip that out. So that is what happens when you need to do two hoopings. Now, I'm going to give you some tips on two hooping blocks in two weeks when we do my block piecer again. So I just wanted to kind of go over uh, the basics right now and uh, kind of get you guys started. So let's uh, talk about um, uh, choosing a block that maybe you need to do some reordering. And so this nested triangle block, the one that we saw in the images for the step outs, um, I'm going to choose this one because it, the software builds it in a way that I probably would do a little bit differently. Okay, so we have our block. Step number one, we chose the block. Step number two, we want to set the size. We could even do that in the block library at the very bottom down here, you could set the size if you wanted to. If you forget to do it here, when you add that block to your screen, just go over to your transform block. And with that selected, click and drag to select everything, you can adjust this block. So you can uh, resize that to whatever you want it to be. Um, it could be eight, four and a half, six. I mean, like it really doesn't matter. You could put even an odd number. Um, most of the time, you know, we're doing even numbers because again, with our quilt blocks, um, if, we, if I have a four inch block, I could do four of these and have an eight inch block when I put the four together. Okay, so now I've got my four inch block. So let's do our workflow here. And I'm going to do auto build and sort numbers and say, yes, I want you to sort. But look what it does. So it's got piece number one is this uh, triangle here. Number two, three, and then it does number four here. And then number five. Now in my brain, I would probably like it to do one, uh, two, three, four, and then do the big piece last. Now, does it matter? Not in this case. Um, you're going to have the same exact type of stitch out. But I want to show you how to reorder it because there are sometimes I do think it makes a difference. So this option up here is the reorder option. If you choose that, it will let you put a number on each one of these pieces. So click it in the order you want it to stitch. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, and five. Once you have all of the pieces numbered, you want to do a right mouse click. Right mouse click is going to set that reordered block. So I right mouse click. And now when I select this block and go to my workflow and I am going to reset this because this is a build that we did before we uh, sorted it ourselves. So I'm going to click on the unit and I'm going to say reset. Okay. 
and then I'm going to do auto build. And I do not have to do sort numbers because I manually sorted the numbers. But if you accidentally click this, it doesn't matter. It's not going to do anything. And then you can see here that I've got one, two, three, four, five for my order. And when I do preview, one, two, three, four, five for my stitch out. So that is um, a way that you can reorder blocks if it's not stitching out in the order you would like. Just understand that um, you do have to put it in an order that will work. So, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that uh, coming up here in just a bit. So um, let me see if we have um, any questions uh, that I can answer. And so I do see a couple of them. I see we have some other um, people that have joined after we got started here. So I want to give a shout out uh, to Judy there in Medical Lake, Washington. Judy, I used to live in Spokane. So that is right next to you in Medical Lake. So right before you get to Idaho over there. So welcome. Thanks for joining. So Wendy from Madison, uh, uh, Connecticut, thanks for joining. And um, I did see some questions. So I'm just scrolling down to get back to those uh, questions. So Chris C says, uh, what is the um, random blue line? Um, the random blue line, it, the blue placement stitch, Chris, if this is what you were referring to, where it uh, does the placement guide that actually is like a placement stitch so that you can see where all of your pieces are going to need to be placed. So if that's not what you were referring to, uh, give me a little bit of a clarification and I'll, I'll answer for you. Um, and then uh, Linda says, where does the edge of piece two butt up to? So Linda, that um, if you pre-cut your pieces, that's probably the easiest when you're getting started because then you'll match raw edge to raw edge. Um, but if you don't pre-cut, you want to make sure that you're covering the seam. So let me go back over here to my triangle. So in this particular uh, block here, this blue overlapping line, the one that's the furthest way from number one here, that is where you're going to place that piece down. And so you can see that the red line is my seam. So I have about a quarter inch of the overlap. So when you're lining up the next piece on top, then I usually line up my raw edges if I pre-cut. If you did not pre-cut, you just want to make sure that you're um, overlapping those areas because it's going to seam right in between those two blue lines. So hopefully that helps uh, there, uh, Linda. So, and Jan says, what color line should the fabric cover? So I think that's the same question, Jan, that Linda uh, was just asking. The blue placement, if I actually hide, I'm going to hide all my colors except for blue. So this is actually a tip for all dime software. If I go over to my all items and do a right mouse click, I have the option to view and then I can say hide all. So sometimes I'll do this um, whenever I want to just select each of my steps. So then I can turn on the blue and this is what you are um, going to make sure that your pieces fit into. So if your piece fits into these overlapping blue areas, and by overlapping blue, I mean this line here that's furthest away from the one, and this one that's furthest away from the one, because this blue line actually is for this piece number three. Um, so make sure that is uh, the overlapping. And you can see here when I turn on this first one, this is the first one that is the right sides up. And you can see that it is part way, not exactly half, but it's part way between those two blue lines. And your piece that you cut will be as big as that um, blue line that's on the outside there. And then when we do our seam line, you can see that it is slightly inset so that you don't see those stitches. So it stitches on the inside of that seam so that you don't see those uh, first set of stitches that tack that first piece down. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Jane. And Jan and Linda. If it does not, uh, ask uh, again and I'll make sure to... Uh, clarify um, a little bit more or try to. So uh, Harriet uh, Palmer says, if you wish to embroider the block, would you do that when the block is finished and still in the hoop? You could do either way, Harriet Ann. And so if you want to quilt the block 
or add an embroidery design, then you absolutely could leave that in the hoop and then either merge in your embroidery design here in the software and have it be all in one file or at your embroidery machine, you could have that merge in. So uh, when I go back over, I'll, uh, I'll show you bringing in that design onto this uh, file that maybe will um, help that make a little bit more sense. So, and then uh, um, this by Chris, Embroidery says, will it do kaleidoscope blocks? So yes, we actually have some kaleidoscope blocks built in, but remember um, this by Chris, kaleidoscope blocks are probably going to be, need to be done in several hoopings because most uh, definitely they'll have some Y seams. You won't be able to do the entire block, but you certainly could do that in multiple hoopings and it would figure that out for you. Um, and then uh, Linda Johnson says, is there an ability to make an SVG file? Yes, there is to pre-cut your pieces. And I'm going to show you that when I go back over there too, Linda. Yes. So to pre-cut your pieces, you can generate an SVG file or an FCM file. Um, you can also generate a paper template that you cut out with your scissors or you can just not pre-cut and put down a large piece that covers that area, uh, kind of like we do with applique. So, and I'll show you that too when we go back over. Um, and then Diana says, how many designs are available built in? Diana, I don't know the exact number, but I do know there are over 1,200 something blocks uh, built in, but you can actually create your own custom blocks, which I'm going to talk about um, in two weeks. So really um, there's, there's no limit and you can manipulate the built-in blocks or you can actually draw your own blocks as well. So um, PS says when um, there are some blocks, why are there some block categories empty like the alphabet and the circle? So I did mention that at the beginning of the presentation that this library of blocks is shared by another dime software called my quilt embellisher and my quilt embellisher has the ability to generate an applique from a block design but we cannot piece in the hoop a curve or a block that has a Y seam. So a lot of times the alphabets either have curves or a lot of Y seams. And so that's why those are empty. And if you have My Quilt Embellisher, you would see those in your My Quilt Embellisher library. Um, can you search for a design that are one hooping? So that's a great question, Kathy. We don't have um, that option built in to search for all that would be one hooping but that's actually a great suggestion. So maybe I'll pass that along. I love that idea. Um, but really it's just about choosing the block that you want and then generating the file uh, to get uh, the block stitched. So, um, and then Donna says, do you have a multi-needle um, monster hoop five by seven? We do Donna. Um, so that uh, is available over at DZGNS or check with your local dealer that carries dime product um, because a lot of times you'll get a special from them. So and then Jan says uh, flying geese. And so Jane says flying geese. Yes, flying geese can be pieced in the hoop. And in fact, I'll show you an example of that coming up here. So uh, let's head back over there and uh, see a few more. And then I'll come back and answer questions again. So if you have questions, keep them coming. I do see a couple more that um, didn't get... Uh, uh, that I haven't answered yet. And so I've got those marked. I'll continue to answer questions. Uh, so make sure that you are asking and I'll try to make sure we get everything answered before we are done. Okay, so let's go over um, and let's first talk about uh, adding an embroidery design and getting those uh, stitch files or cut files for your digital cutter. So let's go back in and let's just do a different block. Um, so for this one, let's do, um, I actually was going to do that diamond, but I actually have another example that I think I would like to show you. So let's do this uh, paper diamond here. And I wanna talk about the reordering one more time. So I've got my block. Step number two is to set the size. Now, this can be pieced all in one hooping. So um, if you want to do this in one hooping, it does need to fit in your embroidery hoop. So I know we have huge hoops um, on our embroidery machines now. So just make sure that it fits within your hoop um, and you could increase that. I have, I know, a 10 and a half by 10 and a half. So I could do a 10 inch block on my hoop if I wanted, but I'm not going to go quite that big. I'm just going to stick with the eight. Um, and then let's do our uh, workflow and see the numbers here. So I'm going to auto build and I'm going to say sort numbers here. And I want to point out again, 
exactly how this does. Uh, this particular block is going to piece number one here, number two, three, four, five. Now from a quilting standpoint, um, I definitely want piece number two to actually be number one. So this is a block that I definitely would want to reorder. So let's do that again. I'm going to do reorder. I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight, nine. Now, these blocks around here, me personally, I'm more of an embroiderer than a quilter. You may have an opinion on which order these go, um, but it is important to me to have number one be the center square and not be one of these triangles. It's just easier. Um, it makes more sense, and it's just a cleaner look. Okay, so once I've set my numbers, I'm going to do right mouse click, and then let's select our design. And then I'm going to um, do our workflow. And then I need to reset that. So at the top, I'm going to do a reset because I did the build before I did the my own manual sort. So I'm going to do auto build. I can skip sort numbers because I already manually did that. And I'm going to do preview. So and you can see that it's in the correct order that we generated. So let's save this. And I'll show you how I would bring in uh, that um, design. So... I'm going to call that my diamond block. Now, make sure you name this or give it to the format for your embroidery machine, whatever that might be, and then say save. And then I'm going to open up that JEF block. So if I open up JEF, that's my machine stitch file. And I'm going to just click and drag that onto the screen. For some reason, it is not working. So let me show you a, a, just a tip in general. I don't know why that's not opening there. So I'm actually going to copy this path to where it's saved and then I don't have as much clicking to do. So I'm going to copy control C and then I'm going to just minimize this, close this and let's do file and open. And I'm going to do a paste and then enter and it gets me right back to where I was. So that's just a little windows tip there and choose my JEF and click open. And there's my file. So I don't know why it wouldn't click and open. Um, it might be that I don't have that particularly set for my embroidery tool shed. Um, and you know, so, but Hey, there's always ways to do it if it's not doing what you think it should be doing for you. Okay, so now here's my stitch file. This is where I would add my embroidery design. So to add an embroidery design, you could do file and merge and locate that embroidery file on your computer. So for me, here's some of my embroidery files here. So I will just uh, scroll down and let's do this embroidery tool shed butterfly. It brings it in. I can resize this if I want to make sure that it fits in my center block there. You can rotate it. Okay. And now I would resave that again. File, save as. And I'm actually going to go back to that same location. That was my diamond block. And I'm going to um, save this as my diamond with embroidery. And click my machine format. So if you go back to your JEF, save, and that is the file you would take to your embroidery machine. Now watch what's going to happen. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to piece your block in the hoop. When your block is done piecing, you can leave it in the hoop, just as I think it was uh, Jan that mentioned, and then it's going to stitch your embroidery file. Okay, so that's actually a really good question and a very efficient way uh, to add your embroidery designs to your block. Piece it in the hoop and then immediately do that uh, uh, embroidery file as well. So cool, right? Okay, now let's go back to the uh, regular file. Here's our regular file. This is the artwork. If I scroll over here, um, you can see in my drop down menu, it just says artwork artwork, artwork, artwork. There are no stitches in these blocks that come out of the library. Whereas over here in this block, you can see that I've got run stitch, run stitch, run stitch for all of these um, different layers. Those are stitches. This is my stitch file. So to create your cut files for your pieces, select the block that is the artwork block don't change the size. It needs to be the size that you generated the stitch file for to make sure that they're going to match up. And then you're going to click this icon that looks like a saw blade. That's our cutter tool. Choose the cutter and it automatically generates 
those pieces for that exact block. Now notice I've got pink and I've got purple. Those match my pieces and they are numbered and it has the seam allowance built in for me. So the purple area is the finished size, but it's going to cut that plus my seam allowance. And I can change those settings down here below. The seam allowance is set for a quarter of an inch, which is traditionally what we do. But if you need to change that for any reason, like if you're doing a really tiny block, a lot of times we reduce the seam allowance. Um, you can adjust that as well. And so you can actually, if you're making, say, six of these blocks, the repeats, if I say I want to make four of them, then uh, click apply and it's going to generate enough cut pieces for four blocks. So that's what we have for the repeat. The spacing is going to be the spacing between those two blocks. Um, so you can adjust that if you want as well. Um, so whatever you do, just adjust, you know, your settings for whatever you want them to be. And when you click save, it's going to ask you a file format. Now, instead of an embroidery machine format, you want to save it to SVG or FCM for your cutter. Or if you have a, a digital cutter that takes a PLT or D DXF, you can save to that as well. So now in the hoop settings, let me talk about this for a second. There's actually an option for paper. And if you choose paper, when you click save, it actually will save to a PDF so that you can print a template. So you can print a template on the paper on your regular printer, or you could generate that cut file um, for your uh, digital cutter as well. So those are a couple of things uh, that you can do in addition to uh, just creating your stitch file. You can also generate those cut files as well. So, um, okay, so let's see if we have uh, what questions we have. So I'll try to pick up where we left off. Um, I know there were some questions that I hadn't quite got to yet. So uh, do new blocks designs get added to the software? So um, we did actually add some new ones and an update not, I don't even remember how long ago, probably back in March or so. It did get a few new blocks um, for sure, but you certainly can create your own, which makes it unlimited. So um, now we have Georgette says, do new block designs get added to the software? Same uh, answer. That's a good question. So yes, sometimes they do. Um, but you can actually create your own, which gives you, um, you know, a lot of flexibility um, for the software. And then Laura says, are, um, you are not connected to YouTube. Oh, I'm not sure what that reason is, Laura. Um, we should be broadcasting on YouTube. I see the little icon up there. So not sure, um, why that is. So I apologize. So Hopefully it'll show up there later, um, just like it should. So um, then Marie says, is there a way to use the scan and cut to pre-cut the pieces? Yes, Marie, we just did that. Use that cutter icon. FCM is the format you would save for your uh, digital cutter. And then uh, Carolyn says, is there a template for cutting pieces if you don't have a cutter? Yes, that's the PDF. So you would choose paper and save to PDF. Um, and then, so you don't use batting. Now you can, you could put batting down and you could actually piece on top of the batting. But most of the time what I do personally, and this is just a personal preference, I piece on stabilizer and then I piece my blocks together and then I have a quilt top. And then that quilt top, I would sandwich with my batting and my backing, and then I would quilt through all those three layers. But if you want to make one block that's completely pieced and quilted, then you could piece right on your batting. You could put that down over top of the stabilizer and then stitch your placement file on top of it. Um, and then... Um, then you'd have it already pieced and quilted in one block. So, and then Marie says, can you explain how to, um, I'm assuming you mean scan and cut. So you would generate that file and then take that FCM file, Marie, to your scan and cut, load your fabric onto your mat, and then uh, it will cut out those pieces for you. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, and Kathy, she says, uh, not really a question, but it would be great if we could um, use selected hoop for sizing rather than by measurement. So 
you could use selected hoop for sizing rather than by measurement. So the selected hoop um, is really just if you're using that size hoop, then you can choose that hoop. And if the design will not fit, it will give you that error. Um, but I do understand what you're saying. Our Perfect Embroidery Pro has the auto fit to uh, hoop. So I do understand what you're saying. So that's a really good point. And then Carolyn says, so is using the embroidery technique, you could quilt the block. Yes. So just like the embroidery, Carolyn, we added, you could also add a quilting design and then quilt right after you pieced it. You could put your batting um, underneath the hoop if you want, if you didn't already put it in the hoop. So, um, and then uh, Mary Jones, says she missed the first lesson. Can I go back and watch all of lessons later? Yes, you can. If you go to our YouTube channel, past uh, software success are there and you can rewatch all of them at your leisure, Mary. That's a great question. Um, and then Elaine says, can you add a step to add batting? Yes. If you want to do a tack down stitch, you can add that. I'll show you how to draw um, an outline and add that. I'll go back over and do that. Um, and then Diane says, uh, so uh, would you tear away the stabilizer before doing that center embroidery file? I would not. You still need stabilizer for your embroidery. In fact, you need stabilizer for your embroidery design more so than the piecing. The piecing is just run stitches, but we have to have a foundation in our hoop to piece to. Um, but the embroidery design always requires uh, stabilizing the fabric that you're stitching on. And in this case, we're stitching on quilting cotton. So you most certainly would want to leave that uh, stabilizer while you're doing that embroidery. That's actually a great question, Diana. Love that. Um, and then uh, Chris Vick, Vick says, when you choose the size, does that include the finish size or do you need to add the seam allowance? That is the finish size. So if you enter six inches, that is a finished six inch block. So the software will automatically add the quarter inch seam for you. So then the block file itself is actually going to be six and a half inches because it adds that quarter inch all the way around. So that's a Another really good question. So, and then Joanne said, um, do you ever use batting instead of stabilizer when creating the block and the hoop? So uh, the batting, if you put batting, you still want stabilizer unless you have a type of batting that is meant to be embroidered directly on. So batting itself is uh, stretchy. And if you piece right on the batting all by itself, if you hoop the batting and piece on it, then it's not... Um, that's not the best stabilization for piecing the block. So, cause your batting is stretchy. So usually we hoop a piece of stabilizer and then you can put the batting down and then piece on top of the batting. You could hoop the batting with stabilizer if you like, but I prefer to do a little piece of batting that's over my placement because then I don't waste so much batting. Stabilizer is much cheaper uh, than batting for sure. So uh, let's just see if we have any other questions. So Facebook user here, not sure the, the name there, um, says, can you share a working file with another person so they can work it and change it? So if they have um, embroidery tool shed, uh, then yes, the C2S file, someone else could edit that and work on it. Uh, so certainly if they also have the program, you certainly could do that as well. Uh, so Kate says, can you use no show mesh stabilizer? Sorry if you already answered that. And Kate, I did, but no big deal. I know that we're all joining at different times. So no show or either a tear away, wash away is my personal preference. Um, that does not mean that's the only thing that you can do. Um, and then Michelle said the same thing. What stabilizer do you usually use? Me personally, I do like to use a no-show. It's a very lightweight cutaway or a tear and wash or our piece and stitch, which is a tear away, wash away, which is a very soft, lightweight tear away stabilizer. And then Barb says, uh, do you ever use battleizer? So yes, battleizer you can piece directly on because it is a batting that has a stabilizer built in. So it doesn't have that stretch. So absolutely, Barb, that's actually a really good option. Okay. So let me head back over and uh, show you a couple more things. If you do have more questions, ask them. Um, I'll make sure to uh, answer before we get uh, finished. So, okay. So I'm going to head back over and then I'm going to go over here uh, to this file because I wanted to point out. So this particular uh, design here, let me turn on all my parts. Uh, this particular 
block that we created, we set it for a four inch finished block. And notice up here in the very top, my design size is actually a 4.59 by 4.59. So that is my quarter inch seam um, that's giving me that extra half inch plus a little bit more. Um, the plus a little bit more is actually these corner pieces here. Do you see how these do a little bit of overlap? So that's actually sticking up just slightly past my seam. But if I do my measurement here and I click on my stitch from here to here, um, I've got my 0.2 is my, my distance there for my my seam. So if you want to change that, you certainly can make those adjustments. Um, now, let me go back and uh, let's do a resized example that is not square. So if you want to, let's do just a regular basic block. I love uh, working with these basic blocks, um, partly because uh, they're easy to understand what we're doing. Plus the numbers are really big on the screen. Um, I, it's not that I'm doing this for really any other reason that they all work, but it's because when I'm showing on the screen and I generate these files, the numbers are big. If I generate a file for a very busy block, um, the number are not so visible. It's really gets kind of all um, busy on the screen with all the seam lines. So now for, for this, let's talk about resizing. And then I want to do the flying geese because flying geese are awesome. And you can piece those in the software um, as long as your hoop will allow, actually. So um, for this example here, this uh, diamond, we can resize any of these blocks even unproportionately. So for this one, for instance, it's an eight by eight square right now. If I uncheck the maintain aspect ratio and maybe make this this, I'm going to do a 12 by uh, 6 and click apply. Um, and this would make a really awesome border block. So you do not have to resize these proportionately. So I'm going to do a three and that actually is really cool. So like if you needed a three inch border or maybe a four inch border around your quilt, um, you could make all of these blocks and have each of those uh, seam together for that block. So, so if we do our stitch, our, um, oh my goodness. So let me close this out. So um, a fatal error on my part. I don't have a, um, a block that that's 12 inches. So I need to rotate it uh, this way. So, cause I do have a, a, um, a hoop that is 14 inches long for my 12 inch block, but I don't have one that's 12 inches wide. So I'm going to go back to my option here. And now we had paper chosen last. That's why it's too small. So I could go through here and then choose my uh, block or my hoop that I know that this would fit into. And then when I do that auto build sort numbers, I just wanted to show you, it will generate that file uh, for that oblong block or that block that is not resized proportionately. Okay, now let's talk about adding a stitch for your to tack down your batting. So I'm going to go back to this block since we already have the file here. Do we have another file on the screen already? Um, this one will work just fine. So let's do that one. Um, so if you wanted to stitch this block out, and place down a piece of batting. I usually place my batting down before this stitch file here because then you can see this on top of your batting. So what I want to do is I want to add a placement stitch for my batting and a tack down. So I can just click this option here for my uh, rectangle. So I can choose this rectangle option here. And, and actually, sorry, I need my run stitch option, not my rectangle. That's my artwork option. I'm so used to doing my artwork in my other software. And then I just want to click to draw that uh, run stitch line. So click, click, click. And I'm not being perfect here. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting it the size that you need. And I mean, that is actually like really bad. I can actually adjust that a little bit with my shape tool if I need to. Um, but you get the idea, right? So I can move those points out and things like that to make sure that I'm square, just like that. And I'm going to hide everything. Remember over here, all items, right mouse click view, and I'm going to hide everything so that I can just turn on that one run stitch. So 
That run stitch that I just drew is the very last thing, but I want it to stitch out first. So I can click and drag it um, to the order that I want, or up here on my toolbar, I have the move to back and move to front option. So if I click move to back, it will put it as the first thing that's going to stitch. Now, this will stitch and give me a placement line for my batting. So I probably would then just let this stitch right on top of it because it's going to tack it down. So I don't need an extra tack down for my batting. I just do that run stitch placement line. If you don't want to go through this trouble, you could always just stitch this and then stitch it again on top of your batting. It's just going to be extra thread, but it still will get the job done. So that's how you can uh, place down your, your batting and give yourself a placement stitch. You can create run stitches in the program. So now let me go to a new page and then I'm gonna open up uh, and then you can see here that we have the, the flying geese, but we also have other uh, geese blocks here. And the really cool thing about flying geese, I'm gonna choose, uh, let's just do this one and I'm gonna just remove these side pieces. You can edit block. So if you don't want these side pieces, you don't have to have them. You can just delete them and then your software will build this block. So if I do auto build and sort numbers and preview, you can see it builds it. Now here's the really cool thing about flying geese. If you're doing a flying geese, say border, you can copy and paste these and make this as long as your hoop will allow. And you could even do two in one hooping. So this is 16 inches. I don't have a 16 inch uh, long hoop. My hoop is 14 and a half. So that would probably work there. And I could copy and paste this and uh, have two that's nine inches wide. Um, and so now when I select everything on the screen and I do my auto build, I'm probably going to get an error here because I need a little bit longer um, hoop. And this hoop list here is um, is j just making sure that your block fits in here. Uh, so in choosing that uh, correct hoop is um, important because you want your block to fit into your hoop. And so now when I do auto build, and oh, it's not wanting to do that. So what I would probably do, it's it's seeing those as two blocks. So let's build this one here. And then you could copy and paste the file. So auto build, sort, yes, preview. So now you could save this file and then open both of those up and put them in one hooping side by side. So you could then make a flying geese border if you want, uh, as long as you can, uh, you know, stitch in your hoop. Now in two weeks, we'll talk about blocks that require more than one hooping and I'll go into more detail on that. So let's see if we have any questions on any of that before uh, we get going. I think we left off with Barb and the Battleizer answering that question. So um, Jan says, could you do two or three in that big hoop to save stabilizer? Yes, Jan, you absolutely can. That's exactly what I was just referring to with the flying geese. Um, you could certainly piece as many as you could fit in uh, your hoop. That's actually a, a great question. Um, then Linda says, if I add a graphic uh, tablet to my computer, as a, a, a input device. So I'm thinking she's talking like a Wacom tablet um, to work with the Dime software. And yes, it would uh, work with the, the software. The Wacom tablets do work just fine. So that's a great question. And then Bet says, um, I wish the hoops were listed in inches. You can actually, I'll show you a tip on that uh, Bet. Um, is it possible to change from metric to interest? So I'll show you that. I'll head back over here and show you that. So um, in your hoop list over here to the left, all of these names are the name of uh, the hoop in millimeters. And the inches actually shows up here. Now you can actually create your own hoops and you can name them whatever you want. So if you create uh, a new hoop, and for if it's a 10 inch by 10 inch hoop, then you could call that my 10 inch hoop or my hoop 10 inch by 10 inch hoop. So you could do that um, to make sure you have your hoops in the way that you want. When you click save or OK, that will show up in your list in alphabetical order. I should have a my hoop in my list now. 
I went past. So maybe I need to close it out and open it back up so it'll pick that up. But it'll show up in your hoop as my hoop and it'll say 10 inch by 10 inch. But when I select these that are built in, I can see my inches right there. So that is uh, just a little tip there on your hoop sizes. Um, and then Jennifer says, uh, can you show us the error? Um, oh, if the hoop is too large, maybe. So if I go to my workflow. And if I choose a smaller hoop, oh, not that one, scroll up, and then let's just choose the 5 by 7 When you do uh, the build, sort numbers, and the preview, it says you need to select a larger hoop. So if that's the error that you're referring to, um, it gives you that. It won't even let you generate the stitch file, so you just need to make sure that you have uh, the hoop selected that is large enough to accommodate that particular design. So that's the error that you'll get. Good question. So, okay. So I think we've covered all of the questions here for, for now. Um, in two weeks, uh, we will be talking about uh, my block piecer again. And um, it is going to be um, a little bit more in depth. But I do want to mention, so if you do not have my block piecer, um, check with your local dealer. That's a great place to get it. Um, if you do not have a local dealer, um, they're the best resource because most likely you'll get a... Um, a uh, better deal from your dealer. Um, but if you do not have a dealer near, you can always go to dzgns.com. Um, and the price for my block piece is $449.99. It does include a 30 minute private tutoring lesson and three PDF tutorials uh, to get you started. And plus, of course, you know, you can come here and learn about your software um, every first and third Tuesday of the month. Um, so make sure you check that out. If you don't have it, it's a really good special. So I see a couple of other questions pop up. Let's answer those before we go. So Bet said, um, thank you for the tip. I think uh, there isn't a 10 and 5 eighths by 16 hoop in the list, which fits the floor. So Bet, it is in the list, um, but it is not where you think. So look at through the list uh, with a really... A keen eye, use your eagle eye. It's in there, but if it's not somewhere that's easy for you to find, you can always just create your own. If you add another one and name it your 10 and 5 eighths by 16, I think that would probably be the easiest uh, thing to do anyway. And then Jan says, can you send right to your brother machine as brother transfer lets you? We do not have the capability of going right to the machine, uh, Jane, so you would save to a USB. If you do have that program that allows you to transfer, when you save that file, you could open it in that program and transfer it. I know that's an extra step, um, but that's actually how I use mine. I transfer uh, via that program as well. So really good question. Okay, so in two weeks, um, I will be back here and we will be going in further depth on my block piecer. I'm going to talk more about the two to three block hoopings and I will also show you how to build custom blocks. And I do have some other things in store too. My block piecer, since it does have the capability of creating a run stitch, you can actually create some quilting designs. So I'll talk about that a little bit too um, as well. So make sure you join me in two weeks on June the 20th at 1 p.m. And every Thursday, Eileen also has a live presentation called Between Friends. So make sure that you join her every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central as well. And this Thursday, I am filling in for her. She's visiting her uh, lovely granddaughter. So I am filling in for her. And Deborah Jones is also uh, there with me. So join us this week on Between Friends as well. So until we have another software success, or I'll see you this week on Thursday on Between Friends. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Coming, and I will see you next time.